33 AD, Jerusalem. The fire fell on the church, and they turned the world upside down. 3,000 people saved in one day. Many are healed. 2,000 saved on another day. Signs and wonders of many kinds. Angelic visitations, dreams, visions, and resurrection from the dead. Vicious persecution breaks out, and yet the church remains on fire. The 16th century, England. Over 300 reformers martyred for their passionate faith. They joined the uncountable list of Christian martyrs throughout the last 2,000 years. William Tyndale, martyred 1535 A.D. The 20th century, God's generals. For whatsoever we bind here on earth will be bound in heaven. Do you know that we can bind sickness? We can bind disease. We can bind infirmity. In other words, we can bind the devil and his works. This authority is not the property of just a select few. Sometimes somebody thinks, well, you know, they, uh, they, they, they are a minister or they're an evangelist, or they're a pastor, or that person's some great, mighty saint of God. But you know, they don't have any more authority than you have. Amen. This authority is the true possession of every child of God. Ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. What power? The same power that had been manifested in his ministry, in his life. The one who had not failed you. And I remember breaking down, and it didn't matter the crowds going by. I wasn't looking for a ministry. I wasn't looking to build a church. I was feeling God's pain for a lost city. And I've never had anything that's been any worth to God in my 50 years that wasn't born in agony. Never, never. It's all been flesh otherwise. The 21st century, the church today. Where is the church now? Selling miracle oil. Jesus' blood in a bottle. Magic and miracle potions. Prayer claws. Churches meeting in pubs. Seeker friendly preaching. Passionless services. Christian television replacing the need for the local church. Most Christians have not witnessed to one soul, let alone led anyone to Christ. To the modern Christian, prayer has become a chore and not a privilege. And prayer meetings are not attended. The church has fallen asleep. Enough is enough. How can it change? Where do we go from here? Jesus, please help us. 15th March, 1939. Germany declares war. One man, Adolf Hitler, would go on to lead a small minority to invade Europe and attempt to take over the world. What was his key? The unity of minority can overpower the majority. Italy joins forces by invading Albania. Japan then joins forces with Nazi Germany and Italy. Now, a small united minority have begun a full-scale world war. Prior to World War II, a small minority led Japan to butcher its way across Southeast Asia, killing 12 million people. A small minority led Russia to kill 20 million people. A small minority led China to kill 70 million people. If a small minority can unite and shape the world for evil, a small minority can do the same for good. 
God rejected the 31,000 and used Gideon's 300. One young man named David defeated Goliath, and the entire Philistine army became afraid. Twelve apostles turned the world upside down. The 16th century martyrs reformed the church. God's generals were baptized with fire and shook the world. Will you unite with the minority and shake your world in the 21st century? It is time to wake up the mighty men. I come here tonight and plead with you. Believe in yourself and believe that you're somebody. I said to the group last night, nobody else can do this for us. No document can do this for us. No Lincolnian Emancipation Proclamation can do this for us. No Kennesonian or Johnsonian Civil Rights Bill can do this for us. He must move down into the inner resources of his own soul and sign with the pen and ink of self-asserted manhood his own emancipation proclamation. It is time to wake up the mighty men. I said it is time to wake up the mighty men. Now, secondly, is family. We have had attacks on families now for years. The government now tells you they've brought in um, laws and rules to, uh, one, they removed Bibles from the schools, they've removed prayer, <clears throat> and there's this political thing where now they say you can't correct your children or you can't discipline your children. They're telling you that if you smack your child, they can take your children from you. I remember when this started and Danny said, you know, they had, they kept putting on TV, call the child, child helpline if you were in trouble to the children. And we went to smack Danny and Danny says, that's it. I'm calling the child, child helpline. We said to her, there's the phone. Let them come and get you and let them raise you. As long as you've grown up in this house, how many know anything without discipline? How many just eat what you want? Some have and you found out. Is that true? Because how many know, I like chocolate. Do you? I like a lot of chocolate. I haven't had any for a long time, but I like chocolate. How many like food? How many like food? You don't have to put your hand up. I'll just take a look at you. You like food, right? But you know, I like food, but I have to, I have to measure, I have to put some discipline to what I eat. So there's a lot of times I've eaten and they say to you, would you like dessert menu? Would I like the dessert menu? Of course, I'd like everything on the, not one, I'd like them all. But I also understand if I don't employ some discipline, then I'm going to balloon. And you know, putting it on is so much easier. It's like borrowing money. You go to the bank, how much do you like? 20,000. Okay, ch ch credit check, ch ch it's in your account. You go to your plastic, sell, you buy, 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 buy. By the, the end of two days, you overdraft again. <laughs> Try paying it back. How many of you know it don't pay back as quick? Eating is great, but you have to have discipline. So when we discipline our children, we set boundaries. <clears throat> Your generation has no boundaries, many of you. Your children are the parent and you are the child. They tell you what they want to do and you say yes or no. Your children says, mommy, give me my iPad. And you're too scared because you're gonna offend them. A child with an iPad. I had a phone at 40 odd years old. You all got iPads, some two or three. You've got TV on your walls. In our house, there's one TV. Everyone sits downstairs. You ain't going to go upstairs and watch nothing where we don't know what you're watching. You come down here. 
You don't co- you, in our household, when the kids were teenagers, you don't come in and go out as much as you, as you like. There's a time you come in, and Dominic tried it with me. There's a time, he, he says, 11, Dom, 11 is time you come in. Don't come past 11. And he tested it, and I locked the door, and I bolted it, and I put the key in the door and turned it so you can't push it out and open it from outside. And I heard his car engine, vroom, 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 and it switches off. Then an hour later, because it's freezing cold. <laughs> then you hear again, another hour. I'm laying in my bed listening. Rev the engine, and it warms up, and you switch it off again. And you hear all through the night, the engine was going. And I said to them, any one of you open the door, you'll join him outside. <laughs> Why? There's boundaries. We are not going to stay in our bed worrying about you outside. You stay in your bed worrying why I won't let you out. We all sleep. You get it? So we're not playing those games. And listen to me, some of you parents are parenting children and you need parenting yourself. Because you don't know what it is. It amazes me. You, you don't know, you don't have any role model to raise a child. You have two or three children and instead of asking someone, you know, how do I do this? You're like, you tell them, go to the naughty corner. There ain't nothing in the naughty corner. Johnny, sit down. Johnny, I will smack you. Johnny, I, this, this is the last one, you know, hundredth time. I'm, don't make daddy mad. Daddy will smack you now. Daddy will smack you. We were in Hawaii one year and Robert Shuler, remember Robert Shuler? He's got the cathedral in, in, in California. And we were on the, on the, rest, we're in the restaurant and Robert Shuler sat on the table next to us. I said to my family, leave him alone. Leave the man. And after two days, he came and sat on our table. And he says, I don't know what it is about you all, but I watched you for the last two days. You all just interact all the time. What a great looking family. That's a Christian looking at our family and tells us what great family we have. How much more is the sinner looking at you? So how do I get my family that way. Well, husband and wife, you all got to stop fighting. Screaming in front of your children. Every time you scream and fight in front of your children, you impact your children. You imprint the child. And many of us have grown, not me, but many people grow up because their parents are violent in front of each other, arguing, cussing, and swearing in front of each other, and wonder why our kids are the way they are. So we got to make a change in the home. That means as a man, I'm going to start taking charge in my household. I'm going to start being the responsible one in my household. I'm not going to fight all day. How many takes more effort to fight than it does to live in peace? How many, I'd rather go home to a peaceful home than a home full of strife. You walk in, I, I've had people phone me, a young man, 14 years old, phone me, say, Pastor, can you come to my house, please? He says, my mom's got a knife and my dad's got a hammer and they're going to each other. Well, these are Christians. One with a knife, one with a hammer, attacking each other. Christians then what impression will the child have? So as a church, we need, to, and a family, we need to be seen that Christ dwells in us. Even as a church family, what's the church known for? Talking about each other, putting each other down. Yet Jesus says, by this shall all men know you're my disciples, by our love for each other. So even within the church, jealousy is rife in churches. It's rife, men jealous of other men, women jealous of other women, couples jealous of each other. In the church, it's a place where we should be able to celebrate each other. When someone like Zimba got married yesterday, we were all proud of him. He's such a, a nice young guy, he, uh, he came off the, the step and I think the music got too much to him and he cut the leg down there, started dancing, but such an innocent guy, you know? His wife is, is just a nice couple and we're really happy for them. Are you? The next thing is education. They said this, if you want to hide anything from a black man, put it in a book. Have you ever heard that saying? Have you, have you ever heard that saying? Come on, you must have heard that. You're the playing smart with me now. I didn't say it. And, and just in case you don't know, my mother is very black. My brother, my favorite brother is very black. He was, they're both dead now. My aunts are all black. I've got more black in me than most of you. 
That's the truth. I go to Jamaica. When we go to Dunge River Fall, that's the my stay over there. Don't talk. Don't talk. Don't say anything because it comes. How many tickets should we get? That kind of talk. You don't talk like that if you want the Jamaica because they have a Jamaican rate and they have the tourist rate. They're called foreign. Foreign. So they have the foreign rate and they have the local rate. So if you go, like, I have to tell her, stay there, don't speak, Danny, go away, don't, don't any of you come there, and I go and talk to them, and I get the tickets at the Jamaican rate, because I can speak the language. And I ain't giving no demonstration, because you all ain't got enough money for that. <clears throat> so, but here's, here, here's the thing, right? We are supposed to be a people that love each other. We are, really. We're supposed to be a people that love each other. But the problem for a lot of us is our culture is binding us. Jesus says your, your culture or your traditions have made the word of God null and void. And as long as you're operating by your old kingdom, you will never be effective in this kingdom. So education means when you, when you are, uh, what you leave school, I left school at 15, what age did you leave? I was 15 in July, 23rd of July, I started my new job. Now, I had a suit made, it was good at the time. Every month I'd get a new suit made. I was earning 10 pounds a week and I'd get a new suit made every month. Taylor, you, you ever heard of tonic? Mo here? Okay, so, <clears throat> but some of my friends didn't do what I did, they went to college. Now, I didn't see the sense of college, when you want money, you want money now, right? So, everyone in this room is paid according to your value. You all, everyone individually in here, in the marketplace, has a value. So, I would go and work, get my 10 pound, go clubbing, wear my tonic suit, get your Crombie, your, your Brogues, your Levi's, stay press, your Ben Sherman shirt with a pleat down the back, feeling cool, go in the club, hook up with some girls, whiny, whiny yourself up on them, and then go home, catch a bus. The years went by, the years went by, and then my friends started graduating from college. Because in the first few years, I was the man because they couldn't get a suit made because they're going to stupid college. They can't afford it because they got no money. So I'm the man. I'm getting all the girls because I'm the best dress, you know. And, and then after a few years, my money didn't move much. And they left college and they began to wear the nice suits. And mine, I couldn't afford them anymore. And what the difference was they raise their value. And every one of us has a value. Some of us is worth six pounds 50 an hour. Tesco, bleep, bleep, bleep. Why would they pay you more? So education is a major part of changing your culture and your community. Education, the educated person, a lawyer, earns more than the shopkeeper. And if you don't raise your value, see, there are things like, we don't want to get into certain areas because we're Christians. I've seen over the years where Christian pastors want to be businessmen and businessmen want to be pastors. It is, if you're in a business, why are you in business? Why are you in business? It's because God has called you to furnish the gospel. It's so that you can become a blessing to other people. That when someone has a need, you'll say, I've got that one. When someone can't pay their bills, you say, I'll help them. And obviously, you don't help someone every time because they become weak. So all the people we've helped, we've given people in this church, one particular lady, we gave her three to five thousand pounds a month for two years. And it makes them weak. So if you're looking for that, forget it. It will never happen again. Because the more you try and help people, Instead of helping them, they don't look at what you've done, they look at what you could have done, and they end up becoming a weak people. But education, it's not too late to re-educate yourself. It is never, in this country where education is so freely given, 
libraries everywhere, internet everywhere. All you've got to do is go back, stop what you're doing, go back to where you went to college, go back to uni, and re educate yourself and raise your value. Because how many, how many wants a nice house? How many would like a house? Where would you like to live? Hadley Wood. We all, Hadley Wood is like four million plus. So Hadley Wood, that means you've got to be earning over a million pounds a year to get a four million pound mortgage. What job are you going to do is going to give you a million pound a year that you're only going to sell your soul for? <laughs> See, so you've got to think about this education and not just to earn money. Education is power. I, I listened to a guy the other day on Facebook where the police was harassing him. Did you see it? The police came up to him, he's in the airport, and he was educated. He says, why are you following me? And he quote, all the laws the policemen were breaking. And he says to the policeman, your name is so-and-so. And the policeman will answer it. He says, under the law, you're, you, you must give me your name and your number. Is your name so-and-so? He says, yes, it is. He says, you arrested me the other day, and now you're harassing me. And he followed the policeman. In the end, the policeman was so scared because most of the policemen stop you like, oh, sorry, sir, sorry, sir, sorry, oh, sorry, sir, you don't do it. He says, officer, why have you stopped me? Please give me the reason. Because you must have a valid reason to stop me. Was I speeding? Yes, you were. Could you have proof? Then you don't stop me because you can't stop me based on your assumption. Right? Why have you stopped me? You need to be, you can't, policemen don't, can't just do what they want when they want. There's laws that govern the police too. So let me, let me tell you this about your education. Number one, as a church, if we're doing the right thing, we'll change our community. We'll change our nation. Neighborhoods, you know, we've seen where, when we got saved, you had um, Balaam, you know Balaam? You drive along Balaam and there was, um, red, there's a red light district. And my wife, at eight months pregnant, put on her coat and went down to Balaam and with the three or four other girls, maybe more, and they'd stand on a street corner with the prostitutes. And she's like, her stomach's out here, but she's standing with the prostitutes. She speak to them and I see her on the floor with men hugging tramps and stuff like that. But they went there and at first the prostitutes would come up and, you know, want to fight. And then the prostitutes realized these people are not actually trying to sell themselves they're trying to help you. And I remember when, when the, the punters, what do you call them, punters? Any punters in here? No punters. <laughs> when, the, when, the, when the punters will come up and they'll lean in the car to the punter and give them a track, say, Jesus loves you. How convicting is that? You're thinking of other things. Do you know what I'm talking about? You, you've got other things on your mind. There's nothing like Jesus to bring you back to reality. And, they've got, and do you know what? After few, about a year and a half, the whole area cleared up. There was not a prostitute. Even the other day, I drove down there not to look for them, but just drive down there. And there's not one single prostitute in Balaam. And we did the same thing in King's Cross. So we are supposed to, I think King's Cross is back in action again. But because the Christians are not doing what they're supposed to do, we are the policemen from heaven that we police the earth. And when things are being done, we don't leave people alone. We fight for their souls. Can you say amen? Businesses were boarded up in glass littered sidewalks following two nights of protests over the police shooting of an unarmed man. Jesus said, in the end times, the world will be in great distress. The stock market fell through the floor today. No one seems to have predicted this, so it's hard to know where it's heading. Jesus said, in the end times, the world will be bewildered and perplexed. A 49-year-old unidentified man went berserk last night, opening fire with a 12-gauge shotgun. Jesus the said, in the end times, hearts will fail through fear. At Victory to Victory Church, we are not of the world. Therefore, we do not live in fear. We live by what God promises His people. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Come to V2V Church London and allow us to teach you who Jesus Christ is and what His Word really says. Call the number on screen or visit v2vchurch.org. V2V Church. You don't have to be afraid.